project Thetbology, and this summer I worked in Dr. Rita Perlingero's lab. I focused on skeletal muscle regeneration and looking at the effects of genetic background and the severity of muscular dystrophy in the mouse model of limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2A. Limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2A is an autosomal recessive disease that is caused by a mutation in the Calpane 3 gene. This mutation leads to muscle weakness and impaired walking abilities. In order to model the disease, we generated a Calpane 3 knockout mouse. However, it was not as severe as the actual disease in human patients. We wanted to test two different genetic backgrounds on the mouse model to see which one would present a more severe dystrophic phenotype. In our results, we noticed in the soleus muscle that the DBA2 genetic background had more signs of fibrosis and collagen deposition. While these results look promising, it's too early to tell whether the DBA2 genetic background is necessarily better than the BLAC6 genetic background. My other project was to look at muscle regeneration after injury. After injecting the mice with cardiotoxin, we looked at their muscles and we noticed that the knockout mice had more fibrosis than their wild type and heterozygous litter mates, which still retain functionality of the Calpane 3 gene. So the purpose of my projects is to validate cell therapies in the future so that we can find a better model for the disease in mice. Hi, my name is Tyler Benning, and this summer I worked in Dr. Dan Gary's lab studying cardiac performance in muscular dystrophy models. This is an important area of research because heart failure is currently the second leading cause of death among muscular dystrophy patients. We were studying a drug called propranolol, which is a commonly prescribed high blood pressure medication. We hypothesized that propranolol would reduce the demand on dystrophic hearts and therefore have a cardioprotective effect. We administered this drug to mice that were genetically modified to serve as models for muscular dystrophy, and we found that mice that received propranolol exhibited reduced cardiac fibrosis. In addition, we worked with the human dystrophic cell line that our lab had previously developed. We sought to show that this human cell line was a valid model for dystrophic cardiac tissue, and we hope to use this cell line in future studies of propranolol. Ultimately, we hope that these studies will offer valuable insight and will have a direct impact on the clinical management of muscular dystrophy. Hey, my name is Ken, and I got the amazing chance to spend my summer in Dr. David D. Thomas's lab this summer as a little high scholars. Now my focus of research was investigating the conformational change and the kinetic change that the cardiac myosin goes through and how three other drugs that we're studying in the lab interacts with myosin. So we were able to conduct this study very efficiently by using a revolutionary technology. It's called TR2 FRET. And basically TR2 FRET uses gradual change in fluorescence of the two probes that's on myosin. And by observing how the fluorescence level changes over time, we can look into how the conformational change occurs for myosin. And we can also look in depth into the power stroke of myosin, which is a kinetic step that's responsible for the force generation for muscle contraction. And by looking at these um, molecular changes that the three drugs bring on myosin, we were able to deduce potential of the two was investigating how the fluorescence level change. And by observing the conformational change occurs, for we can look into how the conformation, and we can also look that's responsible for the force, which is a kinetic step force generation for muscle control. And we studied the structural dynamics of calmodulin, which is a calcium binding protein important for proper muscle contraction. And because oxidation of proteins like calmodulin has been implicated in aging related pathologies and muscle weakness, we decided to purify our own mutant calmodulin and look at the structural changes compared to the wild type protein. So what we saw is a significant decrease in the alpha helicity of our mutant compared to the wild type protein. And as a result, in the future, what we want to do is use another technique called electron paramagnetic resonance to study the structural dynamics of our mutant and see if that, those changes might explain and see if those changes might explain any changes in modulation of the ryanodine receptor. 
And as a result, in the future, what we want to do is use another technique called GAC settings. Hi, my name is Serena. This summer, I worked in Dr. Mary Gary's lab studying the potential for mammalian cell dedifferentiation and regeneration. In my project, I looked at both of these characteristics, specifically looking at the regenerative response prompted in mouse appendages after being exposed to newt-derived hydrogels. So newts were of interest in this study because they have the potential to completely regenerate limbs after an amputation. But mammals lack this capability, so we wanted to see if we could induce mammalian cell dedifferentiation and regeneration after they were exposed to topical newt hydrogels. The extracellular matrix of a newt can be used to construct a hydrogel while retaining collagen and growth factors that could po possibly induce cell dedifferentiation. Newt cellular extract can also be constructed into a hydrogel while retaining um, intrinsic uridelian or newt factors that could prompt dedifferentiation also. Therefore, we hypothesized that the exposure of the topical newt hydrogels to a severed mouse's tail would induce the cells to dedifferentiate into a proliferative and pluripotent state such that the tail is regrown. Hi, I'm Amy Krebsbach and I was in Dr. Townsend's lab this summer where I worked on a project to develop a standardized model of cardiac injury for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is, a, which is a disease that causes muscle degeneration. To do this, we gave mice a single dose of isoproteranol, which is a drug that strains the heart and induces injury. After administration, we looked at cardiac injury at three time points, which were one day, one week, and one month. We found that cell membranes break down by the one day time point and fibrosis of the heart peaks at the one week time point. The methods and findings of this project will be valuable in the future for, for evaluating potential muscular dystrophy therapies as well as the future directions of the Townsend lab. I'd also like to give a shout out to Team Townsend for being such an awesome lab and giving me a wonderful summer experience. Thank you guys. Hi, my name is Adarsh Padiath, and I worked in Dr. Dan Gary's lab over the summer. So, characterization of cellular lineages, or tracing a mature cell all the way back to when it was a stem cell, is an important task in developmental biology. In order to do so, you need to use special algorithms. However, there is a need to have more accurate algorithms. So we decided to compare recent programs to see which one was the most accurate. The software program called Topographical Cell Map, the one made by the University of Minnesota, happened to be the most accurate in finding these cellular lineages. This can help overall in the treatment of cancer and other cellular diseases. Hi, I'm Austin Petronic. I worked in the Tranquilla Lab this summer. The Tranquilla Lab is working on developing tissue-engineered heart valves that have shown potential to grow and recellularize within a patient. This has great pediatric application. Before, uh, before tissue-engineered heart valves can be implanted, they have to be preconditioned first to open and close in a sterile setting. With these objectives in mind, I designed a pneumatic pulsatile bioreactor with variable frequency, duty cycle, and pressure. Using a Medtronic Contegra valve, a tissue-engineered frame-mounted valve, a tissue-engineered transcatheter valve, we determined the optimum parameters for conditioning. We also validated durability over 650,000 cycles of running, and validated sterility over 355,000 cycles of running, and no growth in media over one week of incubation. Hi, my name is Sam and I worked in Dr. Michael Kaiba's lab for the summer. There I worked to study the role of MESP1 in directing differentiation of human pluripotent stem cells into cardiomyocytes. 
The transcription factor mesoderm posterior wander MESP1 has been identified as a key regulator in directing differentiation down mesodermal lineages, including those that constitute the heart. So this study aimed to map the mechanism of cardiac differentiation and determine the role of MESP1 in that process. Performing dose response experiments using a doxycycline inducible system allowed us to manipulate MESP1 expression and, det and determine the dose optimal for bringing about the regulatory role of MESP1. Additionally, we performed a cardiac differentiation protocol by manipulating the WINS signaling pathway, and we quantified gene transcription on a daily basis to put together a timeline of cardiac differentiation on a molecular level. Although cardiac therapies have been improving over the years, the only viable treatment option for end-stage cardiac failure is a full heart transplant. Obviously, this presents an issue as need exceeds availability. Cell therapy has been suggested to be an up-and-coming alternative option, and by manipulating the mechanism of MESP1, we can work to boost production of cardiovascular cells to make cell therapy an alternative treatment option. Hi, my name is Alex Schmeekin, and this summer I worked in Dr. Lau's lab studying the effect of the antioxidant 7,8-dihydroneopterin on the effect of force in dystrophic muscle. Dystrophic muscle has a lot more reactive oxygen species compared to regular muscle, which contributes to the damage of the muscle and subsequent force loss. Therefore, we hypothesized that this antioxidant would protect against force loss in the dystrophic muscle because of its rad radical scavenging properties. What we found was that the low concentrations of the drug did not provide any protective effect. However, the higher concentration of the drug did have a protective effect that neared significance. Therefore, we need to increase the number of trials that we do with this treatment, as well as try other treatments and methodologies in order to properly evaluate the effect, the effect of this antioxidant on dystrophic muscle. Hi, my name is Jordan Sell. Uh, I was working in the lab of Dr. Joe Metzger this summer, and my project is kind of focusing on figuring out what happens when we insert different genes into heart cells. So there's a certain protein in heart cells called troponin that's really crucial for controlling its ability to contract and relax. And it's been shown that different animals actually have different versions of this protein. So mammals like us have one version that evolved to favor increased heart performance, um, but is also susceptible to uh, acidosis, whereas most other vertebrates have a version that doesn't have as high of a heart performance, but is, um, shows resiliency to acidosis. Um, and intriguingly, the platypus is actually the one animal that has its own unique version of this protein. So my project was kind of aimed to figure out what happens when we insert this platypus protein uh, into heart cells. So overall, we were able to show that uh, this platypus protein actually increases the strength of contraction in heart cells, uh, which was not expected. Um, but so it's kind of interesting you try to figure out this protein. So my the one animal that has figure out what happens when we inside project was kind of aimed to figure out this platypus protein version that evolves. So platypus may have evolved this way. Hi, my name is Jing Jing Zhu, and I worked in Dr. Paul Izio's lab, the Visible Heart Lab, which does translational physiology research on large mammals. And my research focuses on reducing reperfusion injury. So when blood flow to the heart stops in a heart attack or a heart transplant scenario, clinicians need to then reperfuse the heart, which is the reintroduction of blood flow. However, the sudden influx of oxygen causes membrane damage and cell death within the heart. And so my project um, explored the potential for ATP to reduce this reperfusion injury in swine hearts, which are very similar to human hearts. And my results showed that the hearts treated with ATP showed significantly higher contractility, which is how much the heart contracts for each heartbeat. So ATP shows good promise for a treatment method to reduce reperfusion injury and can improve patient outcomes in heart transplants and cardiac recovery after a heart attack.